you're looking at this, these circumstances of a risk aversion or a risk crisis or volatility, major volatility event, uh, because you want to look at the Euro USD and be able to decipher which of these two of benchmark currencies is playing the role of a safe haven, whether the dollar is uh, regaining against traction as a liquidity currency, or whether you're looking at something like the Aussie USD, which is a carry trade currency favorite and has deviated substantially from that rule and want to see this particular pair return to its normal bearings. Or perhaps you just want to see the yen crosses which have been driven aggressively by relative monetary policy revert back to the more the easier to understand, easy to read risk based theme. All right. In the FX market, these are all major considerations and certainly do help out our analysis and would help out trading. But we, uh, even in other capital markets, and sp certainly in other capital markets, where we have something like the S&P 500, where we have a massive build-up to one side, and there's a lot of concern that this is indeed too one-sided uh, to continue much further, and people want to get into bargains. Right? This doesn't necessarily have to be uh, isolated to FX. It doesn't have to be isolated to the S&P 500, though I like using the S&P 500 as a benchmark. This can be essentially used in all liquid markets. Right? And we should take that into consideration. But a really important consideration is that when you see a market correction of some substance, like we can reference the 2007-2008 uh, collapse in the S&P 500, that wasn't just something that was pertaining to the S&P 500 or U.S. equities only. It actually spread across the entire uh, market spectrum, all right? the speculative spectrum. And everything was impacted. There were trading opportunities and trading risks wherever you went. All right? But understanding how these develop and uh, knowing that there is some very significant fluidity and differences to how they develop is important to our uh, being prepared, but also uh, being capable of trading a unfavorable turn for the traditional markets. Right? So taking an, an assessment of today's circumstances, this is the S&P 500. Uh, and we have the performance of this market from the beginning of, uh, of 2007. All right, I want to incorporate the correction that we had uh, through that period. This was considered uh, or called the Great Financial Crisis, all right, or the crisis of 2007-2008. And we did have a very remarkable uh, pullback. This was a massive decline that uh, cut the index by more than half in a very short amount of time. Now, since that correction, how far has the S&P 500 retraced? Well, we've actually had a number of 5% corrections. Actually, this red line shows the corrections to the downside. All right, 5% corrections are pretty com uh, have been pretty common through this uh, period, this climb to new record highs, as it were now. Uh, we've had a couple instances of 10% corrections back here in mid-2010, uh, the August-September drop of 2011, and we just almost got there uh, here in the earlier months of 2012. We've had also two instances of 15% corrections, but we have had no 20% corrections. All right. Now, 20% plus correction I would consider to be a uh, major market event, especially if it uh, happened in a very abrupt and aggressive manner. It happened all in the span of one general uh, cycle, I would say, within uh, a couple of months. All right. So we still haven't seen that major quote unquote crisis event. But as we've seen from instances in the past, they can develop in different ways. They can be uh, take time or they can happen, happen quite rapidly. Be prepared for both. All right. So looking at a rapid uh, decline, here we have the 1929 uh, market crash. All right. Very famous, very popular crash. When we look at it on a monthly basis, you can see that it was essentially a uh, spike top. It, was, it went up and then subsequently just came right back down. When we look at it on a daily basis, it's a little bit more controlled, but you can see that the daily declines here were massive. 10% uh, declines uh, just on a daily basis, right? A very aggressive, very crisis-like uh, development. We had a similar situation, uh, but it was more of a one-off back in October uh, of t 1987, right? That was considered the Black Monday crisis, right? Where you had a collapse, one-day collapse that was uh, quite remarkable. Though there were a few days of decline, this collapse here was of incredible girth, over 20% in one day. 
All right, massive. Most of us refer back to these kind of circumstances when we think about a market correction. Uh, we uh, look or we dream of the uh, position that was short risk uh, on a day like this. Or if we're more of the fearful type, we uh, have nightmares about what happens on days like this and we're caught long. All right, but going through the history of price action, how often do these types of circumstances occur? Very, very uh, seldom. Very seldom. And even if we do have uh, circumstances of one-sided buildup on a market and low liquidity and excessive amounts of leverage, all of conditions that we have today in the broader financial markets, it does not necessarily mean that we're going to have a resolution that looks like that. All right. It's very important to understand that we can have something that's a little bit more uh, sedate or controlled. But we do have circumstances in modern uh, trading. Here is gold uh, back in April of 2013. We, I don't think there's really a name for this, but the collapse that we had below the 1500 mark, this was a two-day decline that spanned 14%. 14% decline from this uh, commodity in two days. That's massive. All right, but it was not necessarily unique. We also had some pretty remarkable pullbacks and in, uh, daily declines here, a 5% decline back in uh, September of 2011, all right, marking a general top and an eventual reversal from this metal. So this was still, there's still circumstances here where we can fulfill high leverage, one-sided markets can see very dramatic declines. However, this actually played out, this turn played out over some significant time. Breaking through technical barriers, however, is one circumstance that can feed aggressive uh, downturns. All right. So that technical level that we had here in this April gold drop was around 15,025. We broke through that technical support and it seemed to catalyze uh, stop loss orders and short entry orders, accelerating that market decline. But the general turnover, all right, big build up, took its time to consolidate and subsequently turned, there was ample time to be prepared for this kind of development. All right. That was a similar circumstance to another popular uh, crash in the past, the dot-com bubble bursting. All right. We did here have, with the NASDAQ, a very tremendous set of daily declines, but there was some pullback, and subsequent follow-through on this index took its time. All right. We had massive decline and consolidation, but then eventually a continuation to the downside. The same can be said of the great financial crisis, 2007 and 2008. Look at the rounded top that we had in the S&P 500 here. Technical traders can recognize this is plenty. All right. You had a nice head and shoulders pattern here, or if you will, a descending trend line with two, a double top. Break there, come back up test former support as new resistance, and a continuation to the downside. Of course, things got really dramatic back in, 2000, uh, or in October of 2008 because of the closing of some major financial institutions and their, uh, their unraveling of their positions. But the turn itself was not necessarily a one-day uh, drop-off of record highs. It was a, a process. It took its time. So we can be prepared for these kind of circumstances, and we don't need to immediately, uh, as we call it in the financial world, uh, trading tail risk. Or we don't need to have a trade now trying to play a drop-off in the S&P 500. That would uh, mean a massive decline for the euro-yen after this build-up, and just a, 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 let's say, positioning for a 3,000 pip drop. All right. Those kind of circumstances can take time and they should take time. Even in this concept of a crash, a market crash, it will still offer opportunities to jump on board of such a uh, prolific market development. All right, so we, you don't need to necessarily uh, play towards crisis after crisis after crisis, or if you will, on the opposite side, play to massive run-ups. We trade with reasonable time frames and reasonable probabilities. But in the circumstances where we do see a, uh, cr uh, an unwinding of some of this excessive risk ex exposure, whether it be in the yen crosses or whether it be in the, the carry trades or whether it be in the U.S. equity markets or emerging markets or whatever it happens to be, what will this look like? All right. Well, I do want to reference that we just looked at a number of asset classes, and when we see a meaningful risk aversion, and it's not just a... U.S. equity 
correction. It's not just a yen cross-correction, but it is a true uh, broadly scoped risk aversion theme where investors in FX are trying to get out of uh, leveraged low-yielding carry trade or where equity traders who had to borrow on their position to ramp up their exposure have to unwind their position or commodity traders who were trading in high, uh, high beta, high alpha le leveraged uh, commodities positions, uh, potentially uh, energy positions that would take advantage of growth expectations, those can start to unwind. When all these asset classes start to pull back altogether on the same set of circumstances, a general concept of fear or uncertainty of uh, a long only stable position, that's risk aversion. Right? And you'll see it unfold against all of its asset classes, or most of its asset classes, with a meaningful correction. Right? It's not just going to be the S&P 500, it's not just going to be the end crosses, it's going to be all these markets. All right? And with this, we would expect a uh, rise in volatility and a rise in volume. Now this is very important because right now volume is exceptionally low. Participation, in other words, is exceptionally low. That is another risk that we add to concepts like excessive leverage and a lack of cash to cover potential margin calls should they come. This can actually accelerate the risk that we have with the downturn of risk aversion. It, will, it means that there is a shallower market to absorb negative shocks. There aren't a lot of people that are just trying to buy dips at record highs uh, or not enough to stop a meaningful unwinding and uh, kind of forced uh, a for forced waterfall kind of decline and when it does occur you could have a rapid rapid drop at the same time that low volume low participation means that while we might have a rapid deleveraging of leverage and risk it might not continue for a very ex uh, a very long term trend so we are unlikely to have a uh, 2007, 2008 like decline of that kind of scope, cutting off more than half the market uh, value. We're not likely to have a uh, euro yen drop back to these uh, near record lows or indeed the dollar yen drop back to its own actual record lows down towards 75 we're more likely to see a correction and very likely an aggressive one because of the circumstances that surround its initial advance but it's going to be somewhat restrained in scope right. now I just wanted to look over the concept of risk themes and the possibility of a major market correction not just in S&P 500 not just in yen, cross, uh, yen crosses but in the broader concept of the market itself many opportunities and there's certainly considerable amount of risk but we should not necessarily consistently set up trades for it we should be prepared with how we're going to deal with such a development but in the meantime high probability trades are what we should be looking for All right. so be prepared but don't necessarily be too active on uh, the tinfoil hat theories All right. and that's eventually what it comes down to be prepared but don't necessarily act until it's time to act. Good luck trading out there, guys. We'll do another strategy video tomorrow.